Thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, we really, really appreciate you all coming today for the uh, for the discussion. We have uh, a lot planned for all, and uh, thank you also for those joining us online as well, and uh, obviously for everyone in the room. I am delighted here this afternoon. We have about 100 and over 100 people uh, dialing in and also in the room. So if you, yeah, we just welcome you all. Um, just to start, we do not have any fire drill uh, planned for the day, so do not worry. However, uh, it would be good uh, for you to be aware that when we have any fire drill, we will be expecting you to meet everyone uh, at the reception. And if you could, please keep your phones in silence. And um, if you need to take a call, just please step away. You know, the usual, the usual stuff. So just to introduce myself, my name is Lily, Lily Okoronkwa. I am a consultant at Barrigate Partners and also a One Young World Ambassador. I have uh, recently done uh, an event similar to this, talking about gender and uh, women in te technology and finance. So this subject matter is particularly uh, very close to heart to me as well. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, an interesting uh, discussion with all of you. The, the hashtag we're using today would be Booming Africa. So it would be good for you to share and tweet and LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram, anything you want to do, uh, please um, share whatever uh, input and outputs that are coming out from this session as we would want to make sure that people are aware of what's going on. Uh, I am joined by the stage where, um, by Fiona Sanyu, uh, who is a program officer at development research and training in Uganda and Ethel Boateng to my left, uh, Program Coordinator at Participatory Development Associates in Ghana, and Nicola Jones, Principal Research Fellow in the Gender Equality and Social Inclusion Program here at ODI, Overseas Development Institute, and Chris Locke, Founder and Advisor at Caribou Digital. Before we kick off the session, I would like to invite uh, Melanie Pine to share uh, something around what has been going on at ODI. Melanie is a research fellow in the Digital Societies Program and Youth Forward Learning Partnerships Manager. And it would be good for you to tell us what's been going on uh, within the, the Youth Forward Initiative. Thank you so much, Lily. Is that working? Can you hear me? OK. Well, welcome, everyone, uh, here today at ODI. And also, welcome, everyone, online. I, I'm expecting a lot of partners from the Youth Forward Initiative to also be joining us online. So it's very, very uh, excited to see you all here. I'm particularly delighted to welcome you because this is our first Youth Forward event. Um, and I wanted to give you a bit of background uh, about the Youth Forward Initiative, uh, which was, uh, has been running for about five years now. So Youth Forward is uh, led by um, the Mastercard Foundation in partnership with NCBA Clusa, Solidaridad, Goal and Global community, Communities and is um, taking place in both Ghana and Uganda targeting young people, uh, actually 200,000 young people in both countries um, and putting them into employment or supporting them setting up their own businesses in the agricultural or construction sector in Ghana and Uganda. Um, and we uh, today are having this event uh, as part of the learning partnership, uh, which is led by ODI in partnership with development research and training in Uganda, and one of our speakers here, and uh, PGA Participatory uh, Development Associate in Ghana. And I'm very excited to also have our colleagues from the Gage, um, the Gage program and Caribou Digital and our wonderful chair here. Um, I wanted to give a special thank you to uh, our implementing partners whose dedicated work and commitment to learning uh, really made this event possible. Um, and also um, our wonderful speakers and chairs. Regarding the Youth Forward Learning Partnership, you can also find our, I'm doing a bit of publicity here, our research on the ODI website, the best way is to actually Google it and Google um, Youth Forward and ODI, and you'll have some of the wonderful research that's been done by um, our colleagues here. So thank you very much, and I hope you appreciate the event, and please do feel free to tweet and comment and ask questions at the end of the event. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melanie. Um, our first speaker is Fiona Sanyu. Fiona is a social 
demographer with experience in working and supporting organizational partnerships, conducting social policy analysis, just look at my note here, and engagement in social protection and humanitarian research, monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Fiona is also part of the MasterCard uh, Foundation Youth Forward Initiative, um, and together with ODI, she has conducted a research on youth employment in Uganda's agriculture sector for the Initiative Learning Partnership. Fiona, it would be good for you to share more about what you're doing and um, tell us a bit more about how you did a research around creating opportunities for young women in Uganda's agricultural sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. As I've already been introduced, my name is Sanyu Fiona, and I'm a program officer as well as a project officer uh, under the Youth Forward uh, program, uh, working with development research and training in Uganda. I am pleased to share lessons learned from Uganda on creating opportunities for young people, especially in the agriculture sector. We all know that the agriculture sector employs 65% of Uganda's population, uh, while 31% of the Uganda youngest people are engaged in subsistence agriculture. The agriculture sector therefore holds uh, potential and gainful employment as well as income for young people who by virtue of being in transition from childhood to adulthood can no longer rely on their parents for any kind of support. Uh, because of uh, being young people and also because of going through the transition, uh, they do not have the social economic political resources that are associated with, uh, with being or with adulthood. So this transition process therefore comes with challenges that young people continue to face, uh, young people in agriculture and young people generally. And these include limited or no access to productive resources, uh, which are land and capital for startup uh, and uh, access to input, which that they hardly even penetrate uh, the market, a situation that puts young women at risk and more vulnerable. Programs have been designed, and a number of approaches have also been employed to implement youth livelihood programs in Uganda. For now and today, I'll talk about the role of youth associations and cooperatives in creating opportunities for young people in Uganda. Um, I'll pick specific lessons from a Youth Forward project, YETA, which is Youth Empowerment Through Agriculture, and key findings from the research by Alexandra Lu, uh, Susan Jambi Slapka, and myself. Uh, where we used focus group discussions and key informant interviews to understand how YETA's group-based model has helped create opportunities uh, for young people and also address youth unemployment and underemployment in Midwestern and Northern Uganda. Um, with the YETA group approach, young people are encouraged to form youth associations of up to, but not more than, 35 members. In these groups, young people are provided with training that includes governance, uh, entrepreneurship, foundational skills, uh, financial literacy, sexual reproductive health, and agronomy, agrotechnical skills, among other skills that um, are taught in these groups. So the youth are, are then encouraged to embark on joint group demonstration agriculture proje projects, as well as uh, starting village saving and loan associations with the VSLAs. And while applying these skills, learn uh, to start up individual projects. So the youth groups are also encouraged to identify mentors from within their communities who offer various forms of support. And through the group model and after the trainings, young people have been equipped with the social capital 
including peer-to-peer -peer support and social networks, enabling them to address common problems such as access to information on available services and resources, inputs, skills and training opportunities, startup and expansion finance, as well as land. Um, picking up from the research perspective, uh, we've seen economic benefits for youth participation in, in youth associations and cooperatives. This, this included uh, youth accessing inputs and output markets uh, through contract farming, accessing land from elders to increase on acreage and land uh, for increased yield, while uh, through youth association village saving and loan associations with the VSLAs, we, we documented that young people and young women generally were able to save, uh, borrow to start and sustain their businesses, as well as bought and owned land. Um, youth associations and cooperatives also promoted young people's empowerment. Uh, we documented and youth felt uh, more empowered, motivated, and more confident to work as groups. And this was not only attributed to the trainings they received, but also to the peer-to-peer -peer motivation and mentorship where youth were able to access and demand for information on services and trainings, advisory, extension services and support, and as well as business opportunities from the private sector actors. The groups uh, motivated and speeded up the process of success because young people access the group's resources and labor to achieve successes that would take an individual much longer to achieve. Overall, we saw that and documented that youth association and cooperatives have enabled youth to work together, uh, which allows them to learn, practice, adapt to the new skills. Um, they've also been able to apply these skills to realize their aspirations and as a result, youth are working towards breaking out of the subsistence farming to adopt agriculture as a business. And these experiences have also been aided by digital technologies. They have facilitated and enabled young people to build businesses in a number of ways. And these interventions have been uh, several, but these include encouraging use of mobile money services where young people are encouraged to save money conveniently on their mobile phone numbers. Um, the challenge, though, is uh, the high transaction cost in form of service fees, and, but anyway, it requires a lot of discipline, and which the young people exercise. Uh, the same approach has been applied by Maso, a project in Ghana, targeting youth in the cocoa sector. Um, Yeta has engaged and partnered with financial institutions to digitalize the VSLA model. The financial institutions introduced USSD codes, which are used as logins by the VSLA signatories to access the bank account and be able to transact from their locations, which uh, cuts down the cost of transport to reach to the bank branches, given that these people stay in rural areas and quite remote. In addition to accessing access to finance, a market systems development youth forward project called Driving Youth-Led New Agribusiness and Microenterprise Dynamic has also onboarded ICT innovation companies to provide agriculture extension services, weather information, and a platform for agriculture produce and input markets, thus connecting buyers and sellers through digital technologies. 
Young women are saved with this innovation. Young, we've seen that young women are saved from middlemen exploitation and transport costs to and from the market. However, one challenge that comes with this uh, is young people face in accessing education and their digital literacy is lack of ICT infrastructure in the rural areas. But we think that uh, youth livelihood and empowerment projects could mainstream ICT innovations in project <coughs> designs. There's a lot to really talk about digital technologies in agriculture and development. My colleagues will share more about this in their presentations. Thank you so much, Fiona. This was uh, very, very insightful. Um, just a quick question for me was, obviously very fascinating to see that there are, there are ways to get around some of the key problems that you've mentioned, you highlighted, things like you know, uh, logistics uh, and access to finance. But also, the question I have is around, through your experience and through your research, did you find that there were women-only youth-led associations and, or cooperatives? Did you find any of that in, in the research that you were doing? Uh, in the Youth Forward project, women-only dominated groups um, don't exist, and youth associations and agriculture cooperatives also don't have women-only cooperatives. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in other youth livelihood programs in Uganda, women-only groups may exist. Uh, for instance, uh, the Uganda Women Entrepreneurship Program uh, only targets uh, women-only groups. Uh, in our research, we did not come across any, anything like, like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because it would be interesting to have seen what the dynamics were when it was women only versus mixed. But uh, I guess that will be you know, another phase of, uh, of your research. And uh, also, just to touch, on, to touch a little bit about uh, the power imbalances and the gender dynamics, is uh, we did much as we didn't come across them, we, it's important to know that these power imbalances and gender dynamics exist at household level, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that uh, given that if they don't, they are not existing at group level, it doesn't mean that when they exist at uh, household level, they won't affect women participation in group activities. Yeah. Thank you, wow, very, uh, very interesting. Um, now with the floor is Ethel Votang. Uh, Ethel is a development practitioner with experience in social economic research, policy planning, multi-stakeholder and community engagement, project implementation, monitoring, evaluation and learning. She is the Ghana coordinator for Youth Forwards Learning Partnerships and together with ODI she has produced a research on getting Ghanaian youth into work in the agriculture and construction sectors and obviously youth aspirations. She's passionate about mitigating poverty and inequality and promoting sustained social development. Ethel will be talking to us today about creating opportunities for young women in Ghana in the construction sector. So I'll pass on to Ethel. All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I bring you warm greetings from Ghana. Today I'll be talking about creating um, opportunities for young women in the construction sector based on our learnings from our year dear projects which sought to encourage both uh, males and females in the construction sector but with a focus on the females because it's a sector that you don't have a lot of young women going into. Now, that's why the progress that women have made in joining the workforce, there are still some sectors that are male-dominated. And an example is the construction sector in Ghana, where we have about only 3% of women working in that sector. And although the sector is booming, it's labor-intensive, there are lots of job opportunities in the sector, you find young women very reluctant to work in the sector. And there are a number of reasons why this is so. I'm going to share some with you. And health, uh, health and safety concerns, and then also the perception of the long-term fiscal health effects on fertility and loss of feminine features, which affects the young woman's ability to even find husbands. 
a reason, as some of the reason why young women are not comfortable with working in the sector. We also have issues of the perception of um, inadequate physical strength to, and to, to work in the sector and also inability to take up the physical risks associated with the sector as compared to the male peers. And young women not having the self-confidence of being capable to acquire the technical skills to work in the sector is also another issue that comes up. And when we have young women who have been bold enough to even embrace this and take up position in the sector, there are challenges where they are teased or they are mocked by people on the job. And so it makes them uncomfortable and then they have to leave. There are times that they don't get support from their family and from their peers to the extent that some families even sabotage girls who decide to go into construction. And it's all because of the social norms where the society does not accept that women take part in some economic activities such as construction. It's seen as manly and they do not want their daughters to engage in such economic activities, especially when I have talked about the fact that it's going to affect their female features and prevent them from getting husband, which is very important to them in terms of their social beliefs. And then also you have young women not wanting to aspire for jobs in these areas because um, once aspiration is shaped by your lived experiences and also the social messages around work. So whilst the social messages around work in the sector is negative, they do not grow up, growing up, they do not see their mothers or aunties or grandmothers working in this sector. They're probably into trading than having aunties, grandmothers that are architects or contractors or masons or carpenters. So it's not something that they are used to. And all this put together does not encourage young women to aim to work in this sector and actually work towards um, building a career in this sector. And so what the EADA uh, project did was to train young people with technical skills, provide them with mentorship and then internship in this sector to allow them um, acquire some skills to be able to work in this sector. And with this project, we're able to engage both males and females. And I would want to share with you our lessons with, um, with the practicalities of engaging young women in the construction sector. And this is mainly in three blocks. The first is make participation possible. And that is, we want to talk about uh, mindful mobilization, where you involve both the community, the families, and the use of female mentors and people who are already, females that are already working in the sector to mobilize young women into this sector. Because this, this increases the support and helps in changing the social norms. And then also providing financial um, support to enable them access training, which is in the form of stipends for transportation, for childcare, for insurance, and all other things that can enable them to access training and waiving of the enrollment and the examination fees of some um, activities so that they can easily take part in it. And then also when we plan a flex training schedule, it has to be flexible, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that these young women have some um, household responsibilities and so training schedule should be said that it it's, it's accommodates those um, household responsibilities. Um, we Then mentors making mentors or role models that are already working in the sector very visible to them, which make it very normal to them to also take the same path as some other women have done. The second is to create safe spaces. With safe spaces, it's about looking at all the threats to safety, which include the location of the training centers, the physical infrastructure even available at training sectors and even um, the sites where their jobs take place, and then also transportation options, and all this put together with the location, it has to be easily accessible and safe so that young women can take part of uh, training and also work in the sector. And then anti-harassment policies, it's very important to put in place anti-harassment policies because it's a kind of support them and provide the conducive environment to for them, preventing people from intimidating or making offensive jokes or making mockery of young women who want to go into the sector. 
and even ed educating them on their rights and supporting them when problems um, arises. And then also, it's important to do gender sensitization training for the other colleagues that they are trained with and even in their workplaces so that they are supported. Because at the end of the day, when young women are trained, they are trained with males, they have to support them in the training. And then also, when they go to the jobs and they go back to the community, the community people will serve as their clients. So it's important to educate them that women who are trained in this sector are also competent and you can equally hire them to work with you. And the third issue that I want to talk about is soft skills and then the transferable skills. With soft skills, it's important to focus on some gender-specific soft skills, such as training them to be assertive, and then also dealing with sexual harassment. Because um, when it comes to the work, after they've been trained and then they are working, these are some of the skills that comes in handy on the job. And then also training them in um, job hunting and uh, networking skills to be able to build their client's base even after training it in order to ease their transition. Because it's totally different if a female carpenter mm. or mason is looking for clients compared to a male carpenter or mason. So they have to be equipped with um, these skills. And transferable skills is also important because there are instances when young women do are interested in the sector invest in the training and actually start working in the sector. There are times they have to quit or exit the sector because it's not compatible with their family. And so these transferable skills enable them to easily move to another sector that they want to work in without being unemployed. And I would also want to talk about the te how technology has been used in our project. Fiona already talked about the mobile money services. It's happening in EAD. In addition to that, we had a system where um, clients could send a short code to request for the services of artisans, and but this was just both sexes. It was for both sexes. It doesn't matter whether male or female. They could just request for the services of artisans, and then we had another system where daily test messages were sent to um, young people that were trained under EADA for them, just to refresh them on the good practices in managing their businesses. And although all these things were, it was not unique to females, it was to both sexes, in future, I think we can consider having initiatives which will ensure that, um, digital in initiatives to ensure young women, maybe clients can request for the services of young women. Young women can share information amongst themselves on where to find jobs and in places where um, they are safe to work and all that. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say that when it comes to engaging young women in the construction sector, the challenge has deep roots in social norms. It's about attitudes about work and what is considered within the society as work that men and women can do. And so if we want to tackle with the issue, change will definitely happen, but um, it will happen when we have more women choosing to work in the male-dominated sectors so that they serve as role models, they change the narratives, and it enhances the lived experiences of young girls as they shape their aspirations because they see that a lot more women are in this sector. It becomes normal, and so they can easily choose to work in those sectors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethel. Um, very interesting that you mentioned that um, when other women see the presence of other women yeah. uh, in a sector, then they feel that they can go into that sure. sector. So the question I have for you is, from the time you started running Year Dear, have you seen an increase in interest from young women or more people coming to knock on your door to say, oh, we want to get involved in this? Yeah, that, there's been increase in the interest and especially in the areas that they, they even want to operate in. Um, because we have the, the, the first cohort that we're trained, we have young women trained, and then they went back to the communities. They see that they are doing well. Their lives have changed. They're able to get contracts. And we, we made it in such a way that in recruiting these young people, we allowed those that are become our success stories to go out there and then to share with them that this is how we've been able to get jobs in the construction sector. The sector is booming. It doesn't matter whether you are a woman, you can still work here. We are doing well. Our families accept us. And because of that, we are able to get a lot more women. And some have even taken up upon on themselves to actually train women. And so they go around to look for other women that they can also train and then work with. Second question for me following that is, um, what 
technology tools or what other channels have you used apart from the word of mouth have you mm. used to then share the success stories of some of the okay. individuals that have gone through the EADA program? All right, so we've, we've, EADA has done a lot of media engagements. Um, aside their boot camps where they organize events and these events are normally streamed live on Facebook, on other social media channels so young people can watch. They also have documentaries that they show on TV and radio discussions where um, we use these tools because that is what a lot more people listen to in Ghana and we want to reach a wide range of people. So we use different um, tools to reach out to people and it's working because you realize even after you've had radio discussion afterwards, you had lots of people calling, asking about the project, they want to sign on, they want to get involved. So it, it's working. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, we'll keep all the questions to the end, just in case some of you are, are looking forward to, to, to sharing this. Um, our next speaker is Nicola, Nicola Jones. Nicola is the Principal Research Fellow in the Gender Equality and Social Inclusion Program here at ODI and the Director of the FID-funded nine-year global mixed methods gender and adolescence global evidence research program. Her expertise lies in the intersection of gender, age, and uh, social inclusion and social protection. She has conducted a wide range of policy research project studies in East Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and obviously covering a range of issues such as gender-based violence, child marriage, caste transfers, access to education, and the digital divide. Nicola will be talking to, to us today about how young girls are use, using digital medias and the digital divide in Ethiopia. So giving us another perspective on, on what's going on in this area. Hand over to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to share some findings uh, from Gage. Uh, and in Ethiopia, uh, which is one of our focal countries, we've been doing research with 8,000 adolescent girls and boys together with research partners in Addis Ababa. And I think the way I'd like to frame this is that we know, you know, including from the, the two first presenters, that there's um, very rapid adoption of ICTs uh, in Africa. But at the same time, um, girls and women are almost universally um, have less access to technology than boys and men. And so I think, you know, we really need to be thinking about how can we fulfill the promise of the SDGs in determining that no one is left behind and promoting access in a way that doesn't reinforce existing gender inequalities. So just to give you some broad background about Ethiopia, I think one of the key things to think about is while there's a lot of excitement on the continent, as highlighted by the hashtag Booming Africa, at the moment, um, Ethiopia lags regionally in terms of access. Um, although it does suggest that it's then poised for extremely rapid growth um, in usage over the next few years. But the number of mobile subscriptions per 100 people is a quarter of that of South Africa and less than half of that of Nigeria. And the proportion of the population that is online is still less than one in five. So half of that of Nigeria, for instance. So... Uh, the work that we've been doing in Ethiopia covers both uh, urban and rural areas and as part of a global consultation process to feed into a new general comment around the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So this general comment is trying to understand how do children's rights uh, resonate in this uh, you know, digital age. And as part of that, we talk to young people about their usage um, of uh, phones and, and internet. And you know, we clearly saw that adolescents are rapid adopters, um, especially amongst the younger adolescents, it's often due to peer pressure, and that access is often on shared platforms. So many young people may not have their own phones, but they are sharing those of, of family and friends. Uh, in the case of boys, they're going to internet cafes or sitting outside hotels to try and hook onto the Wi-Fi. Um, and if they're lucky in some of the larger urban areas, may have access uh, to internet and public libraries. Interestingly, uh, we found that 
of the, the younger cohort that we're looking at, so these are young people between uh, 10 and 14 years, only 5% of young people in our sample had access to a phone compared to 48% of older peers. So it's definitely something that sort of 15 to 19 year olds have, have much higher access uh, to. But then we saw um, very dramatic differences in terms of rural-urban divides. So in many of the rural areas where we're working, electricity is rare, um, let alone internet access. So mobile technology is um, facilitating leapfrogging. It doesn't require wide connections and powers, uh, power because you can get access to, to solar energy in some places. But overwhelmingly, our findings still highlighted that radio, and in some cases, TV, remains a much better way still to access young people in rural areas. So I think you know, a message here is that care needs to be taken uh, in this enthusiasm for, for digital technologies, not to also ignore older technologies if we're trying to reach young people, especially with social change messaging. Interestingly, we found, though, that in pastoralist communities, so in the Afar region, for example, there's much greater uptake of mobile technology um, because it's very helpful um, when young people are the ones who are migrating very long distances with livestock so that family members can keep in touch with them. So we are seeing some, some surprising uh, patterns there. But generally, um, the adoption of ICT is much more common in better off and better educated families and is much more urban. Um, we found that amongst the older girls in urban settings, um, that girls are less likely to have a phone, 39% compared to 47%, and a half as likely to be online as their male peers, so 18% only compared to 36%. Part of this is because parents are not allowing them to do it. They fear that it may disrupt social norms. Um, as a 15-year-old girl told us, they think that if a girl has a phone, she's going to flirt with boys. And because of that, she, they worry that she will stop school and they're not giving her access. We also find that girls are less likely to have paid work and their own incomes. So they're less likely to be able to buy their own phone. Um, they tend to have less free time than boys because they're spending hours still each day on household work. And then they face um, much greater mobility restrictions. So whereas boys in urban areas might be able to go to an internet cafe, um, even access to libraries tends to be um, very restricted for girls. And this is particularly the case um, in the current context where there's um, increasing um, social violence in, in urban contexts in Ethiopia. What we did find, though, is that the digital um, age is opening up new worlds for some young people. So it's definitely linked to higher aspirations. It's exposing them to a much wider range of role models. So we found that young people who do have access to technology um, invariably named um, people outside their family or their immediate um, circle of friends um, as a potential role model. It's facilitating learning. Um, it's particularly helping young people to become more politically aware. So there's a big youth movement that's been part of the political transformation um, that's led to the, the coming to power of Dr. Abi, who just won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and many people attribute the access to internet technology um, as part of the ability to mobilize young people so rapidly. And I think in the case of girls, what's exciting is that it's also helping some of them to protect themselves from child marriage. So I'll just give you a quote from a 12-year-old divorced girl whom we talked to. And she said, I used my brother's phone. I called my sister and I informed her straight after the marriage. She arrived and she talked to the village chairman and my marriage was cancelled. So this is a case of you know, girls getting access, even who might be very vulnerable. She's now back in school um, and out of that um, very early arranged marriage. And then we also heard from young people um, with disabilities, particularly those with hearing impairments, that mobile phones can really be transformative. Um, you know, most people don't have sign language um, communication skills, so texting can be, can be very, very helpful for, for young people in those contexts. But I think at the same time, um, what our findings highlight is that both caregivers and the adolescents themselves agree that technology can be distracting and is keeping many young people from focusing on their schooling, 
um, and that there are real fears, in particular, that Facebook um, is spreading misinformation or fake news, as we're also concerned about in this part of the world. And in the case of Ethiopia, it's been linked to civil rest, uh, civil unrest, sorry, and ethnic tensions. So as an 11-year-old boy told us, the, there are people who do not love Ethiopia, and they want to conflict with one another. So they're disseminating false information through Facebook. Um, I think other types of risks are gender-related and also very concerning in the absence of uh, good guidance, either from, from schools, from youth leaders, or from parents. So many of the boys in our sample openly admitted to downloading porn and using phones and social media to compare pictures um, of their girlfriends and how they didn't necessarily live up to the, the images that they were seeing online. So obviously creating very problematic um, uh, norms around um, uh, relationships and, and sexuality. Um, and then a number of girls also uh, highlighted that um, some of the adolescent marriages that we're uncovering um, have been initiated through online uh, relationships. So whereas the, the big concern in Ethiopia used to be about child marriage that was arranged, now we're increasingly seeing um, adolescent-led uh, marriages at, at young ages, and um, you know, some proportion of that is facilitated through online technologies. We heard repeatedly in this context that uh, parents' ability to intervene and teach young people how to be safe online is very much limited by their lack of formal schooling. So there tends to be a, a very stark gender divide. Um, and uh, parents uh, you know, highlighted that they're not getting information through parent and teacher associations through schools. There's not um, any kind of of access uh, to guidance as to how they can provide a, you know, appropriate limits um, on their children's usage. And this is something that's becoming quite a social concern um, and is also echoed by local government officials that we've been talking to. Thanks so much, Nicola. Um, one thing I was just uh, thinking of as you were sharing your speech was, what are the tangible recommendations that you see coming out of this? to be able to achieve that um, gender equity in terms of access uh, to technologies and, and, and digital literacy as well. Do you mind touching upon that? Sure. So I think, first of all, there's a, a major difference between rural and urban areas. So for rural areas, um, I think the, the top priority has to be about ensuring access to education. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, many goals are not going beyond primary school. Um, so they're lacking um, the, the general literacy and then the critical thinking skills that are needed to be safe consumers once they do get access um, digitally down the line. So I've just come back from a couple of weeks in Ethiopia and we were only able in one district to find two girls who had gone beyond grade eight. Um, you know, it's very sobering. And I, so I think you know, in our excitement to focus on innovation, we also just have to continue to be scaling up those investments in education. In terms of urban schools, um, while um, they're... Uh, you know, young people in, in urban areas do have increasing access to ICT. As I mentioned, I think the key thing that we're hearing from people is they're not getting access to online safety guidance. So many girls complained of cyberbullying, um, of cyber harassment, um, and so I think making sure that there's um, you know a big outreach to both girls and boys to to try and address that. And um, particularly also in terms of how to be critical consumers of um, content on social media. Um, you know, I think many young people in urban areas we're talking to are severely affected by the, the violence that's happening um, at the moment um, in many of the cities where our research is taking place. And, uh, you know, young people schooling, many of them are having to drop out or move to different schools because of ethnic violence. And so there's a real concern that that, that is a, addressed um, and people become much more um, discerning consumers. Then the third thing I would say is that there are youth centers in many urban parts of um, the country, but at the moment they are very male 
friendly, not girl friendly, girls that are afraid to come, often because of fears of, of sexual harassment um, at those centres, they also are not geared to, um, you know, attract girls as very much um, sort of pool and darts and, and things that are typically considered to male um, recreational activities. But that is definitely a, an entry point where young people um, may be able to get better access both to Wi-Fi but then also to, to better guidance. And then finally, I would really highlight the importance for young people with disabilities. Um, so obviously, you know, access to texting for those with hearing impairments, but we've been doing participatory work with young people with visual impairments and just basic access to um, you know, audio materials um, and to simple recording devices so they're able to you know, go back and, and listen to, to lessons afterwards with things that they highlighted were critical. Thanks for that. Uh, second question for me is, um, Ethiopia now has a female president. And most recently, I'm just looking at the, um, the, the, the gender. There's, a, there's a, a gender conference going on in Rwanda uh, from the 25th to the 27th. And it's ending tomorrow. And she was one of the speakers at the event. Do you think that now having a female president in Ethiopia has changed anything? And given that you just recently came back, what did you see that is the difference between the rural and the urban areas in that aspect? So for urban girls, and I think boys to a certain extent, President Salawak is a, you know, a great role model. Um, in urban areas, girls were talking very excitedly about her and the fact that 50% of the cabinet is now female. Um, unfortunately, in rural areas, people had not heard of her, um, and particularly girls. Um, they had very little information on even who was the, the prime minister, um, and quite a lot of in misinformation in terms of you know particular activists who they believe had you know much more influential roles than than they do. Um, so unfortunately, uh, her. Um, you know, she's not inspiring the, the younger generation and, and rural areas as yet. I think partly because there is such a, a stark digital divide. We did hear some boys were aware um, of who she was um, because they are more likely to be traveling further away to, to markets and they had been observing you know, posters um, that were talking about uh, new political leadership. But for many girls, and particularly married girls, really no idea. So, for that. Somewhat sober. Yeah, yeah, really good. Thank you so much. Uh, our last speaker today is uh, Chris Luck. Chris is the founder of Caribou Digital. Previously, he was the managing director at um, GSMA Mobile for Development, helping the mobile industry to build services to improve the lives of the poorest people in the world. Chris has extensive experience working with uh, mobile and internet industries and also with companies, uh, Virgin Group, 3 AOL, T-Mobile, to name a few. Um, Chris has maintained links to the research community, uh, given that he was uh, a, a lecturer previously in University College of London, and he's the editor of Thumb Culture, the meaning of mobile phones in society. Chris is a visiting fellow at the University of California, San Diego, and a digital ambassador to the UN Capital Development Fund. Chris, you'll be talking to us today about uh, micro and SMEs and digital platforms in Africa and how young women are building their businesses using um, digital technologies. Okay. Yep, thank you. Um, just firstly, to follow on from a lot of the comments uh, from my, my fellow panelists, particularly around confidence and culture, one of the main barriers we have um, with young women and their digital adoption and usage is around um, the fact that in all of the user research that we see um, in, in most of the areas in the world where we study, there is a significant underreporting of skills by women and a massive overreporting of skills by men. Um, and, and the way we can challenge this culturally is by looking at how we promote where there are successful female entrepreneurs in the digital sector. So we have some stand, you know, outstanding examples. The head of Jumia, the largest e-commerce platform in, in, in Africa, is, is female. But they are few and far between. Um, we launched a project this year with Flourish Ventures and the Financial Times for a female fintech prize for Africa as a way of trying to encourage more um, visibility um, and awareness of the paucity of, 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 of female leaders in, in African digital entrepreneurship. And that's a structural problem. I mean, to be honest, it's hard enough if you're a, a white American in Silicon Valley to get funding for your 
um, company from uh, ven uh, venture capitalists. When you map that into local markets in Africa, where still most money going into digital businesses in Africa goes to expats and not local founders, it becomes even harder. So one of the ways we can create positive role models and aspirational role models for young digital entrepreneurs is making sure we're funding vis businesses that have young local women running those digital businesses. And I think creating that kind of positive uh, set of role models will have a significant effect. On the more positive side, we, we've done a lot of research into the use of digital platforms um, by micro SMEs and informal workers um, in Africa as part of our learning partnership with the MasterCard Foundation, um, our partnership for finance in a digital um, Africa. And what we see is very interesting because we see a significant digital quasi-formalization of the informal sector. So we see lots of people using digital platforms for their existing jobs and for their existing work. So this isn't people necessarily migrating from real world informal work to digital micro work, but actually people running their existing businesses in, in new and interesting ways using digital platforms. And overwhelmingly, the platforms that people use for this are Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and others. And at one level, we see people using these platforms to, to find their markets and to find their customers. So uh, following on from the comments about the ag sector in East Africa, we sometimes see Facebook groups of 40,000 small old farmers um, using those Facebook groups to exchange information, sometimes to trade. And this is a massive opportunity, but clearly also has as some risks around um, the lack of uh, formalization and reliability in those platforms as well. Equally in our research, uh, and to give an example, we spoke in Kenya uh, to a young woman called Dorcas, who was uh, uh, housebound due to illness, trained herself to bake using YouTube videos, and created an online cake baking business in Nairobi, where she finds her customers for a mixture of Facebook Messenger, Facebook and WhatsApp, and then trades over uh, mobile money. Equally, at the same time, she's using uh, other platforms to upskill herself and, and to develop her own set of skills and her ability to trade, doing small amounts of digital micro work, and at one stage was even um, the outsourced personal assistant for a businessman in Russia booking all of his travel. So at the same time, we see how access to platforms and increasingly cheap access to data and services is actually allowing people to find entirely new ways of doing business and, and entirely new ways of, of making their own local businesses work with the local community. So I think this is exciting and encouraging, but as I say, opens up a certain amount of vulnerabilities. Um, firstly, these aren't formal work platforms. There, there are good formal work platforms that people use that provide a certain structure to transactions and a certain amount of security about the way that that work is conducted. We see this through the platforms everybody knows and loves or hates, such as Uber and others. But we also see Sweep South in South Africa. We see um, um, Hello Task in, in, in Bangladesh and other platforms that try to take everything from transportation to domestic work into digital platforms and to encourage people to use those digital platforms to, to find work with their clients. And this helps a lot to bring securitization to people. Once someone is on a digital platform, there is a level of trust in the transaction that you can bring in that isn't there if people are using informal platforms like WhatsApp and Facebook. You can then, once people are using digital finance on those platforms to, to conduct their work, start encouraging them to lay away to cover illnesses or to, to pay for pensions and, and other uh, long-term financial services um, that are beneficial to them. So this slow kind of formalization of the informal economy using sometimes ad hoc digital technology is a massive potential boon. But there are still massive vulnerabilities and, and I'm picking up on Nicola's comments in Ethiopia about how these platforms also are, are a negative because of the way they um, spread fake news and often expose users. Obviously one of the things you have to have if you're going to transact digitally, whether formally on a work platform or informally via social media, is an identity, is a profile. And in many cultures, actually just creating as a young woman a profile on a platform opens you up to an astonishing amount of abuse and a huge amount of vulnerability, whether that's actually in the way that people interact with you on the platform or way your family and culture um, uh, 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 sees your positive and, 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 and active participation in these platforms. And so we've done a fair bit of work as well, funded by the Australian government in, in, in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, and understanding how digital identities enable or, or, or create vulnerabilities around the way that women find work. And it's fundamental that you have some form of identity, whether it's formal from the government or informal from a social media platform, to enable you to transact. 
but you need to have power and agency over that identity. And to really benefit from this, you need some way in which that identity is working for you and in your control in the way that you can find work and, and, and structure that work. We often see where an Id a state identity or a formal identity document is held by uh, the father or the husband in the family. Young women having to use other people's identities to find work and to transact. And those kind of, uh, kind of quasi-enfranchisements are worrying because you're getting the benefit of accessing the uh, ability to find more work using digital platforms, but you yourself have no identity or agency that, that you can control. So there is a real need to understand how we create digital spaces where, where women can find work that give them that sense of safety, that give them that sense of control and responsibility, and also make sure that in formalizing uh, their work and, and their participation in the digital economy actually enables them to improve the livelihoods of both themselves and their families. So I think a better understanding of how a lot of the informal economy is slowly digitizing and seeing what those behaviors are and understanding how we can improve on the successes and challenge some of those vulnerabilities can create a, a really exciting way for you know, very low income populations and particularly young African women to start to participate in the digital economy in a far more meaningful way. Thank you. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, I have a question around, you mentioned um, how um, people can be able to still take ownership of their power and identity and also how companies can intervene to kind of protect that uh, identity. I was wondering if you can expand on how the private sector and also policymakers, tech companies in general, can intervene to, to help to make that happen and kind of almost like formalize this um, informal economy that is building via a social media. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult and it's tricky because obviously the informal economy doesn't want to be formalized for, 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 for a lot, lots of reasons, both but both cultural and individual. So often being able to transact online without necessarily having to tell the government who you are, um, whether that's for political or taxation reasons, is, is, is often something people don't want to do. But nonetheless, looking at ways in which formal identity platforms can work with digital identities, whether that's a phone number or a social media account, are, are really important to understand how you then bring people into the other uh, you know, positive benefits of being in the informal economy, informal society, whether that's understanding how this can encourage people to participate in more formal skills, education and development, you know, the vast majority of upskilling on, on transactional platforms and, and media we see is entirely peer-to-peer -peer or informal, so it's people self-training on, on YouTube or, or joining communities of practice on Facebook, etc. And, and that's great, but you know, we, 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 we don't always know what the quality of, of, of that information is. So getting some kind of a link to an identity to enable people to participate in new ways of digitally credentialing and showing what their educational um, capabilities and skills are is one positive way of trying to get people to link those things through. But I think you know, explaining to people where the strong benefits are in, in, in that linkage is, is critical because for the vast majority of people that we speak to, maintaining some kind of quasi um, separation between formal identity and their social media identity is important. And sometimes it's willful. On a lot of global digital work platforms, um, we will often see teams, particularly on digital writing platforms and digital work platforms like Upwork and, uh, and Script Bay and others. We will see teams of, of, of young African workers hiding behind a stock photo of a young American white guy because it means they can charge more on that platform for their work. So identity in these spaces is, is very much often a mosaic of lots of different things that work in different ways for the individual and how they find work and, and how they develop their skills. Um, it's a very contested area and, and one I can talk for at least another 40 minutes on, but I won't. But there, there needs to be a really strong explanation of what the benefits for tying formal identities are to the informal ones that people create in, in, in private sector, mobile phone and social media companies. Um, another question I have is, obviously climate, climate change is also a very important uh, topic, uh, across, not just in the UK but across the world. Um, are there any kind of climate smart technologies that you found uh, that could help women upskill and enable them as well to get into the digital economy? Yeah, we, we're seeing, uh, we, we run a big program with the UK Space Agency on understanding the use of, of satellite technology for um, 
uh, achieving the SDGs. And, and we often talk that our work really comes together uh, when we consider the way that the, the three S's come together, which is satellites, smartphones, and sensors. And I think particularly in agriculture, we're seeing a lot of businesses, such as Pula, uh, an African business that uses smartphones to allow smallholder farmers to register where they plant seeds, and then earth observation data to get in very, very granular risk profiles um, uh, for agricultural insurance. is is a really interesting way in which technologies are coming together to try and at least deal with the consequences of, 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 of climate change in these countries by making the risk models for insurance uh, in the ag sector much better and more productive using a mix of, of, of mobile technology for placement and satellite technology um, for, for risk assessment. So there's not specifically a gender aspect to, to, to these stories at the moment, but I think the you know, I, I always choose the wrong metaphor, but the price of Earth observation data from space is crashing, um, which is entirely the wrong metaphor to use for space technology. But um, we, we're seeing available Earth observation data getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and that's helping people build very climate resilient models for a wide range of insurance and other financial services in the agricultural sector. Thank you so much uh, to all the panelists. Uh, but before we open the floor to the questions, I'd like to invite Alex Lowe to provide an additional uh, comment around what we've discussed today. Alex. Uh, thanks very much, Julie. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for such really uh, interesting presentations. So I'm a researcher here at the ODI, um, and I work together with Ethel and Fiona on, on some of this research and just wanted to offer a reflection on digitalization and aspirations, which um, everyone has touched on in some way in their presentation. Um, in the research that we did, our focus was on aspirations and how they're formed and what they are and how that interacts with young people's increasing access with digitalization. So we found that even in very rural areas, most young people are exposed to digital media in one way or another and in urban Ghana in the construction sector, you know, quite, quite regularly and quite frequently. Um, and as we know, aspirations are formed through exposure to lifestyles and careers and different ways of, of doing things and seeing what it is that other people are doing and what, what might be possible. And typically, aspirations are formed more closely in the family and peers. Uh, but then with social media, there's increasing influence coming in from the outside world. Uh, but what, what we found in that as well is that there's a risk in, in, in social media and, and, and um, you know, digital access that young people develop either aspirations that are, are too low. In, in a sense, they're despondent and they see no relevance of what's happening online to their own lives or they develop aspirations that are far too high and why we would all like to be as rich as, as Donald Trump, for example, you know, that, that's <laughs> not really going to get anyone particularly far. Um, so, it, you know, one, one of the things that we found is that, that um, youth employment projects would do well to think um, about teaching young people how to aspire more effectively and how to engage with what they see online um, and to think um, much more about how, um, you know, small steps can get you some of the way and then how to in interact with, with those aspirations. Um, and so, you know, to do visioning exercises as, for example, Yet has been doing. Um, and also to try and establish, um, you know, links with people who are doing similar things overseas, who aren't, you know, as as far removed as as the the pop stars that they're normally, in, you know, seeing online, um, and just not leaving young people to negotiate that space on their own and providing them with some helpful input into that. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, we'll be opening the floor now to questions. Uh, so. If you want to ask a question, please tell us your name, your organization, and please keep your questions very brief. <laughs> Thank you. Questions in the room? Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, my name's Nana Ampafo, and I'm with uh, Songhai Advisory. We uh, support um, sustainable investment in sub-Saharan Africa. So two, two questions that come to mind. One. Um, Ethel Boating, I was thinking, um, have, you found, have you found that higher education institutions in Ghana have been supportive, um, either directly as peop, uh, um, uh, in terms of groups that you're engaging with, or just in terms of the sorts of students that they're producing now? I'm thinking about places like Ashesi now and the sorts of students that they 
produce. And then the other question was, given the points that, um, that um, Dr. Jones and uh, Chris Locke, you, you were both making, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about some of the social media laws that our, some of our countries are producing at the moment and how we should think about them or how we should engage with them um, in order to protect the space that, um, um, the, this digital space and, and the opportunities that are there. If we could take two more questions and then we'll let the panelists respond. The lady in the back. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you, um, thank you all. This, these were really interesting presentations. And um, I, I had actually two questions. Um, one was specific to Ethel um, about the engagement of the, of the communities in kind of shaping the norms around what, what is considered as work that is appropriate for for, for young, young women. Um, I was wondering what was it that worked with getting the support of the parents and the guardians? Um, and then a more general question. Um, I'm kind of getting two narratives from, from, from the different presenters. One outlining in way, ways in which the digital technology can help young women or basically young people more generally to, to bridge certain gaps around access to markets, access to finance, so on and so forth. Um, at the same time, some people have more access to it than others. Um, some have more access, others have more acceptance of using digital technology um, that, that are based on nor gender norms um, or other factors. And uh, as a general question, I was wondering if, if they, there's a kind of narrative that's emerging around whether these are actually ways of kind of reducing inequalities or whether they're actually increasing them in gen gender equalities among, among young people. Yeah. Okay, uh, start with Nicola. Do you mind taking the, one of the questions? Sure. Um, so just on the first point about the social media laws, um, you may have been following the story of Jawa Muhammad um, in Ethiopia. So he's a big... Um, uh, activist who's created a, a huge following both in the Ethiopian diaspora and, and Ethiopia itself, um, I think has played, you know, um, up to now a very positive role in um, contributing to the broader political transformation that's happened in Ethiopia, but there's also been some um, negative um, effects as well. And so as a result of that, the government is trying to um, create a law to counteract um, fake news. There's a, a real concern about how that's being um, used in, in dangerous ways by, by some political activists in the country. I think that's important, but at the same time, because of the generational divide I was highlighting, I think there's a, a really great need to be investing in um, providing support to parents and communities as young people do start to engage more with technology. You know, what are some of the guidelines that they should be aware of? What kinds of things should they be monitoring? How can they be taught um, to, to consume critically? I think that you know, that's vital and for, for the um, school teachers. Um, across the country as well. So I don't think a law in itself is enough. I think it's about how do you then socialize, you know, a, a broader culture about responsible usage. Um, on your point about um, whether or not uh, inequalities are being exacerbated, I think um, at the moment we are seeing a, a real divergence between rural and, and urban communities, um, and then even in rural spaces. Um, those that are further away from districts, towns being you know, much more marginalized again. So I think there needs to be a, a sort of a, a twin investment, not only in <coughs> getting access to, um, for young people to access some of the, the great innovations you were talking about, but ensuring that at the same time, we are committing the, the critical resources that are needed for just basic education and literacy because those um, young people are being left woefully behind. Um, and I think, you know, for girls who are, who are married as children, that's, you know, particularly the case where they have such, um, you know, tight surveillance by in-laws, by husbands, by communities in terms of their access to the outside world. I, I think, you know, that's something we need to be very, very conscious of. Okay, Ethel. All right. And so talking about engagement with the university, just a little background. Um, the, the young people we work with are actually um, disadvantaged young people that are school dropouts. But we've had engagements with 
the university. Actually, Ashasi University is one of our partners for the MASU program, which is the COCO program. And it is Ashasi University developed a business academy curriculum, which is actually used to train the young people. And the students have even been involved in activities because that times that they visit the field to support with research in terms of doing research on the business opportunities that exist in rural um, communities that the young people that we train in entrepreneurship development and entrepreneurship skills can take advantage of. And we've also involved um, the universities because um, with the construction sector, we identified that health and safety was a huge issue when it comes to the construction sector and we did we've done a couple of uh, youth forums where we invite the young people that are in the informal uh, the young people in the construction sector that is the youth that we engage with as well as students who are in the university we've engaged with KNUST that's Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology students from the building technology department students from Takradi Technical University where we've created a platform where we have those who are in school acquiring skills to work in the construction sector and the kind of young people that we work with who have not had um, formal education and this is to bring them together so that they get to share and some of their knowledge and then also to bridge the gap between those who are being trained in the higher education and construction and also the youth are youth who are from quite a disadvantaged background so we've we've been in touch with academia and then we've involved them on the project um to the question of engagement of uh, community what we've learned that works is working with influential people in the community. Because of the nature of the social norms, and um, before we do mobilizations, we engage with the existing local structures and people who can influence um, the local communities, get them to understand what the project is about and why we want to um, encourage a lot more young women to go into the construction. And by this, we get them to understand the project for them to be on our side. And once we are able to do that, they also influence the community. So they are there to support with the mobilization. They are there to ensure that young women that are recruited stay on the program and are trained. And also, even when they are trained, they also serve as people who encourage the, 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 the citizens or the their yeah, um, inhabitants in the community to also use the services of females so that a young woman that are trained can you know earn income otherwise you may train them but people still the stigma is still there and so they may not even be able to use the skills so using um, local leaders that are influential in the communities is what has worked with the UD project okay uh, Chris you can add on that and then you can so, so very quickly, on the inequality question, the, the World Bank's WDR 2016 report on digital dividends pointed out that in the 30 years since we've seen rapid adoption of ICT globally, income inequality has massively increased. So there is absolutely no correlation between um, increasing adoption of technology and, and, and breaking of, of, of inequality. Um, it's way more complex than that. Uh, I, I tend to say you know, digital technologies are always in the quantum state of being both bad and good at the same time. It's an incredibly nuanced question, and we can't make assumptions that um, in any way tech is liberating um, in, in, a, in a singular way or not. So it, it has tremendous potential, but it has tremendous problems as well. And I think going back to the policy question, um, the policy around social media is not an African problem, it's a global problem. And, and for, for companies like ourselves that advise clients on policy, for me it's fascinating because it's probably the first time a technology policy issue has hit everyone globally, every, uh, everywhere at the same time. So there is absolutely no leadership on what good digital policy looks like at the moment around the world. Um, you know, the African leaders we talk to say that they look at the European and uh, US parliaments and see empty seats where the leaders of Twitter and Facebook should be sitting. And that sends the message that there is nothing to be done. So you then see very arbitrary and random um, policies like Ugandan social media tax and mobile money tax, which are completely counter counterproductive. What worries me more is that people will look to China, which on one hand actually has the only digital economy that's genuinely increased rural incomes and, and has a very transactional digital economy that could work well in other countries, but obviously has the most ridiculous state-led surveillance uh, internet culture there is in the world. And the concern is that people look at that and see, well, 
at least they're protecting their digital borders and, and, and managing to manage an economy, and perhaps that looks more sensible than the far more liberal uh, European or US model. So I, I don't think there's any good stories from a digital policy perspective at the moment, I'm afraid, um, but it's something that everybody is in the same situation in. Fiona, do you want to add more on, on what's been shared? Um, yes. Um, on the question of inequality, um, there's a likelihood that we'll have increased inequalities in access, well, when it, in terms of gender access to these uh, digital platforms and use of these. But one way I believe uh, that can be taken is investment into um, ICT infrastructure uh, and expanding or extending this to rural and remote areas to enable access to for both um, young boys and, and, and girls, uh, but also in a way it will bridge the gap, the, gap, the inequality gap between access, uh, for access in the rural and the urban. Thank you. So just uh, to add on that, the point we mentioned earlier around um, social norms and you know, community engagement, how would that affect, especially in Uganda? Is there an issue around access and breaking social norms that are for, for rural people? Um, there have been initiatives and, and also uh, many uh, programs have sort of addressed this uh, through community engagement, uh, where parents are engaged into programming mm -hmm. uh, and also um, the government has, has also uh, provided uh, facilities for young people to meet and in a way it's also promoting and sensitizing parents about the need for youth uh, associations and cooperatives yeah. so people are, are able, young people are able to access the different uh, services and programs. Yeah, and I believe it will in a way try to reduce the inequality uh, gender-wise. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions from our online listeners and viewers. Uh, from Dimitri, head of office, UNCDF Uganda. How can we mitigate the disruptive effects of technologies on young women and girls? Another question from Dimitri is, how can we prevent a growing digital divide, which we kind of touched on before, between women and men, urban and rural populations, are we not contributing to growing inequalities and reinforcing the existing ones? Uh, the last question from um, Kwabena Apia from Sol Solidaridad, West Africa, for Chris. Um, how challenging has language and literacy barrier in digital intervention been in places you have worked and what solutions have been employed? Okay, I can start with Fiona. Do you mind taking one of the questions? Um. Just related to what I, I've already said, yeah. I think uh, investment in ICT uh, infrastructure is really key to try and uh, reduce the inequalities that a, exist that, uh, and those inequalities that may, might also come across because of uh, the digital technologies. Okay. Yeah. Would you think there will be differences for urban and rural or just investment? Would the investment be more for the rural or also widely democratizing that uh, investment? I think we need to democratize the investment, uh, but also with uh, focus on um, engaging community to, uh, and also young people to form the, the cooperatives and groups to be able to use these uh, at even the remote uh, areas. Yeah. Okay, um, if you can take the, the question around uh, language and liter literacy uh, barrier in digital intervention. Absolutely. Well, I mean, obviously, at the moment, literacy in general is a barrier to adoption because the vast majority of, of services are textual um, at some level. Although most of the platforms we see that people use, whether it's WhatsApp, Facebook or, or, or Instagram, obviously effectively self-localize because people use uh, their own language in their posts. So even though the outside of the program might not be localized to a local language or a local dialect, the content that that community of users is building is. So, so that in and of itself is, is, is a boon. 
as we move more and more to voice as an interface, um, which we've seen in, in more developed markets through uh, Google Home and um, Alexa and others, that has a huge potential. Um, um, but what we need is investment both within the private sector uh, and within the development sector in building uh, platforms with bodies of language that understand local culture and local dialects. So we wrote a paper for the Gates Foundation on uh, natural language processing that pointed out that a lot of the publicly available tools that allow you to run AI or machine language to understand and translate and enable text and language to be used as an interface independently of, of, of keyboard interfaces is still primarily based on the few key profitable languages in the world. So AI and machine learning systems uh, in the private sector tend to put more effort into getting 4% better at Chinese, English or Spanish than they are in going after the really long tail of, of languages that would open up these systems to the vast majority of, 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 of uh, uh, people for whom literacy is a problem in accessing these platforms. Um, and equally, not just from an interface problem, but when we come back to the question of, of policing social media and, and regulating it, um, the ability for vast global private social media platforms to understand local language context and, and, and cultural content and therefore to understand what is hate speech or, or, or what is fake news or what is problematic is, is really difficult when those companies themselves don't have significant bodies of employee, employees or operations in these countries that understand that. So again, it's unfortunately a kind of a two-sided argument from me. At one level, investment in, in local language, natural language processing could really open up the internet in a, in, a, in a voice interface way to many users for whom literally is a problem. But to make that work and for it not to become problematic in those countries, we would need serious investment in understanding the contextual culture um, and language usage within those communities to make sure that that the, uh, you know, the potential downsides of, of, of those platforms being used by a larger population aren't realised. Uh, some more questions? We can take two questions. Yeah, Len? Please don't forget to share your name, organisation, and keep your question brief. Thank you. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, my name is Antoinette Sala. I'm a farming and food consultant. Thank you, panelists, for your information. It's been very refreshing and uh, uh, very tactual as well. Uh, so thank you very much for your information. My first question is to Fiona. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about um, land ownership in Uganda? Uh, you spoke about youth accessing land through the elders. Are there any other options, for example, from inheritance or from the land registry where they can buy? Uh, again, to uh, Fiona, are the trainees okay, really excited to be trained to be farmers and entrepreneurs in agriculture? Um, the second question is to Etel. Do you think that in Ghana, uh, in the construction sector, um, parents are really influencing their children's aspiration or interfering in their children's aspiration. Uh, the third question to, uh, yes, I've got a question for all of you. Uh, yeah, you said that there was a, um, a, an Ethiopian president. Is there a gender ministry? And uh, to, the, to Chris, do you think that digital entrepreneurship uh, do you think that digital entrepreneurship should be taught at school? Hi, I'm Rachel Marcus from ODI. A quick question to Ethel. You mentioned the importance of safe spaces in the construction sector and anti-harassment policies. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, whether you've had any success in encouraging construction bosses to adopt these kind of policies and implement them. And if so, how you've done it. Thanks. Any other question from the audience? Okay, we can start with Chris. If we can. I'll be very quick. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is this on? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am a media global development researcher in the UEL, University of East London. Um, I want to ask you, Dr. Jones, about what you were talking about, the inequalities with uh, the urban rural places and also boys and girls. How can we make it more equal? Like, What, what strategies can we have to make it more equal? Is my question. 
So one more question online is how can we encourage young people to maintain access, um, better market access through their youth associations? And if you know that would be for you, you can take that question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So with uh, parents interference, it's real. And I think on the ODI website, we have um, digital, digital stories of um, about four of our youth titled Constructing Futures, where you can um, learn more because they tell their stories of how they engage in the constructing sector. And they talked about how their parents resisted um, them when they wanted to go into the sector. Even um, one of the youth whose story is also featured, Ruth. Ruth was part of BBC's 100 Women last year. And in her story, she talks about how when she took she participated in the EAD project and she enrolled in the training to be a welder. Her parents resisted it at the beginning, so she had to um, hide it at the beginning, not showing it to them because she got that resistance. But later when they realized that she was actually good at it and she was doing well, then they decided to support her. So it's real, it's happening. And then we have our youth, some of them recount their stories, which is also available in our Constructing Futures um, piece of work. Um, in terms of the safe spaces, what we have done is to, um, with our model, engage our master trainers who train our youth. So we take them through um, a number of models with a curriculum that they use to train their youth. And we make them sign on onto an anti-harassment policy where they, they we, we do a memorandum of understanding where they agree that they will ensure that the staff that they work with and also all the other people that are in, the, in their um, in their setup where the young people are trained will respect the females that we take there to train and offer them the needed support to go into the training. And this has been successful because for visiting young women on the field that are being trained, they are very comfortable. We ensure that the spaces, uh, wherever they are receiving training, for instance, they have um, um, facilities such as even washrooms where they can comfortably use washrooms because there are places that's even where there is training women do not have access to washroom which is an issue for most of the women so it has worked with the people we've worked with because we ensure that we are very straight when it comes to selection of the master trainers that we work on on the project okay. Chris, have you yet? so very quickly on digital entrepreneurship yes but then we have to build a digital economy that enables them to be digital entrepreneurs. It's no use teaching it if people can't act on it. So we need in investment into to African uh, digital founders. But, I mean, we, we did a report three years ago on the app economy globally um, because there's been a fad for the last five years or so of let's train everyone to be an app developer and then people are going to make their fortune. And we saw that on Google's platform, which is 99% of all transactions on app platforms in emerging markets, Three years ago, there wasn't a single African country where Google allowed you to be a merchant. So you, we could teach you to code, you could upload your app for free to the Google platform, but Google wouldn't let you take any money for it. Um, it's slightly better now. I think there's about six African countries where Google will allow you to have a, a, a merchant account. But you know, why did we spend five years teaching people to uh, code for, to build apps that they were never ever going to build a livelihood from? So you know, digital, teaching digital entrepreneurship is wonderful and it's aspirational. And it looks great in prospectuses when people talk about programs in that space. But if there isn't actually a meaningful economy locally that they can earn money from those skills, then we're absolutely wasting our time. Um, just briefly on the, the comment about inequalities. I mean, I, I think the it's not just about access to technology and uh, infrastructure. It's also very much about addressing the underlying social norms that a number of people have talked about. So I think you know, the reason that girls are not getting access is often because parents and family members are, are monitoring their behavior. We need to break down those discriminatory gender norms, and that needs to be through community awareness raising, through media campaigns, and, and so forth. Because actually, when you look at the behavior of, of girls versus boys in terms of accessing these, the, the problem is, is not with girls, but that's the way um, it, it's policed at the moment. So I think th that needs a, a sea change. Another thing that I, I think is worth highlighting in terms of inequalities is during the Global Disability Summit last 
year in London, um, there was a big push around um, ensuring that people with disabilities have better access to assistive devices. But I think you know a big concern is bringing down the price points of those. There was many fabulous um, examples by private sector providers um, at the summit in terms of you know access to. Um, uh, technology for, for people with hearing impairments, with, with visual impairments and, and so forth, but certainly not in a way that could be um, disseminated at, at scale for the young people who need it uh, in Africa. So I think we have to work on, on finding subsidized ways of, of addressing those inequalities as well. Uh, yes. Uh, commenting on how uh, we can maintain access to markets uh, with the groups, uh, that's... Um, a discussion and uh, a lesson that we've picked that uh, once the youth are organized in associations and cooperatives, they've been able to uh, bulk their produce. And so when they bulk, they're also able to negotiate for better prices. And then therefore we have sustain sustained markets for the agriculture produces. Uh, in terms of the training, um, the trainings are not necessarily to farmers. The trainings that, that are provided under the YETA program are trainings to support uh, the young people, um, organize themselves and sustain their groups. And the, the, such trainings include the, the ones on governance. There are trainings on uh, foundational skills where they are taught uh, basic numeracy and uh, life skills. Um, there are trainings on sexual and reproductive health and uh, also agrotechnical skills and entrepreneurship. So these sort of trainings that are, they, they are taken through uh, youth, they help them to sort of get into a joint demonstration incubation business to apply these skills as they also uh, start to plan to on how to engage and also plan in video businesses. So the trainings are not necessarily linked to agriculture, but they are facilitating them to be able to invest uh, this knowledge to acquire the different uh, uh, enterprises they would like to engage in and also aspire as they, they grow. Um, the land, about the land ownership, Yes, in Uganda, uh, land is mostly owned by men. Uh, <coughs> and so the reason um, young people uh, are young and in the process that they're transiting from childhood to adulthood, they don't have resources such as land or they've even not reached uh, the age or their parents haven't died to be able to inherit land. But when they are organized in, in youth associations and in cooperatives. They're able to access land um, from the elders who own land to be able to engage in agriculture. So it's sort of an arrangement the group has with the elder to use their land or borrow their land to be able to engage in an agriculture enterprises. But also we see that because young young people are, are participating in these associations and cooperatives. They've been able to engage in small enterprises where they've been able to acquire income and save it within these organizations. Uh, and so use that or even borrow more in addition to what they've saved to be able to uh, buy land, not really big chunks of land, but land that can uh, help them engage in agriculture enterprises. But my colleague Alex can as well add to that. So, well, thank you everyone, and thank you to the wonderful panelists. Uh, I guess this has been uh, very educating and, and also I've learned so much from you guys and it was a very engaging uh, discussion. Um, gender obviously and uh, digital uh, technology and, and the, the wider economy in general cannot thrive without having us um, looking to how we're operating, whether it is from 
how businesses are operating using technologies, as well as whether we are addressing uh, the gender differences and the, the gaps that we have currently. And we have learned from today that there are so many other factors that need to be considered, especially when we're talking about uh, countries in Africa, for example, social norms, traditions, families, access to finance, um, logistics, and the environment in general. But we also see that there is a tremendous opportunity uh, for companies to address this, these challenges, as well as for individuals to teach one another uh, where we can. So I just want to extend a massive thanks to uh, the, the panelists, as well as those who have joined us online and uh, everyone who is, who is in this room. So thank you so much for attending today. I've certainly learned so much from this panel, and uh, I hope you take away uh, things for you to think about and implement. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.